The brand new RTX 5060 Ti is here, but is this the new high volume $429 GPU the PC building market really needs right now, or have Nvidia missed the mark yet again with another disappointing 50 series release? Well, in today's video, I'll be sharing detailed performance benchmarks of this card at 1080p and 1440p, showing you guys the parts I would pair it up with to build a gaming PC for in and around $1,300, and hopefully, a assembling a pretty nifty gaming PC build. Let's do this. Let's kick off straight away by talking about the 5060 Ti and running through the performance numbers, because guess what? We've already tested it. The RTX 5060 Ti is launching initially in a 16 gigabyte variant with an eight gigabyte variant to follow at a later date. This is gonna come in for $70 less at MSRP than the previous gen 4060 Ti 16 gigabytes at $429. Now this is a much more reasonable price point and only highlights how much of a rip off the last gen 16 gig 4060 Ti card really was. Now you've only got a 128 bit memory bus, so it's still fairly narrow, but you do get GDDR7 memory, which is quite a bit quicker than the memory we got last time around and quicker than what AMD seem to have gone for on their Radeon 9000 series. Annoyingly, Nvidia haven't given any media the eight gig card and we don't know when the non-TI variants land in either, which makes it hard to recommend which of these three cards is really the better buy. Now the 5060 Ti comes at a really interesting time in the PC building landscape. We need volume driven cards. We need GPUs that are going to retail for sub $500 that you guys stand the chance of actually being able to buy, especially given the highly inflated prices of the last gen 40 series GPUs. Something I've already expressed my disdain about in a recent video where I talked about the ridiculous stock and pricing issues surrounding the 50 series and Radeon 9000 launches. How realistic this pricing is actually going to be in the market, I'm going to come back to that in a moment. For now, let's look at the performance numbers and see how this thing really stacks up. Starting off at 1080p high rasterization, and in Cyberpunk 2077, the RTX 5060 Ti delivers a fairly respectable 132 FPS on average. This represents around an 11% increase over last gen's 4060 Ti 16GB, though this is notably a good chunk cheaper, which is good, though rather disappointingly the 5060 Ti 16GB falls short to the 7800 XT from AMD, the closest AMD competitor card at around a $499 MSRP and lags significantly behind the more expensive 5070. Tune up to 1440p and the frame rate improvement is much greater, 25% this time around with an average of 90 FPS, but again the card still falls short to the 7800 XT and understandably lags away behind the 5070. A 1440p high in Cyberpunk but this time with upscaling, whether that be DLSS, FSR or XCSS set to quality and ray tracing on medium, the 5060 Ti here delivers only a 6% performance improvement over the 4060 Ti 16 gig, but does hit the all important 60 FPS marker. Fortnite at 1080p competitive delivers a pretty unbelievable frame rate as you might expect, but only a 5% performance uplift over the last gen card, while Hogwarts Legacy at 1080p high sees a bigger uplift, but still in that 10% region with 12.9% on the 5060 Ti versus the 4060 Ti. Tune up to 1440p in Hogwarts Legacy and we see closer to a 20% performance improvement with the 5060 Ti actually beating out the 5070 based on the fact it's weirdly got four gigs more VRAM than Nvidia's more expensive GPU. Move through into Call of Duty's Black Ops 6 at 1080p high to wrap things up and the 5060 Ti is virtually tied with last generation's 8 and 16 gig variants of the 4060 Ti and represents really no improvement. Sadly in Marvel's Rivals we don't see a particularly big performance jump here either with a 94 FPS average on the 5060 Ti 16 gig just five frames per second quicker than that found on last gen's 4060 Ti 16 gig variant. Now in conclusion, my thoughts on the 5060 Ti are really mixed. I'm disappointed that Nvidia haven't seeded us the eight gig variant to test. And I think that the overall MSRP situation, especially in North America, in the UK, things are sizably better, is frankly ridiculous. It's hard to give my verdict on this card for its $429 price point if I simply can't trust that this price will actually be seen in the market. I think it's good to see 
see the price drop on this comparative to the last gen option, but I'd be lying if I said I wasn't hopeful the 56 DTi 16 gig would have represented a sizable performance jump over not only Nvidia's last gen options, but AMD's 77 and 7800 XT cards too. Now, what would I pair this card up with? Well, that's a good question. And the CPU I've gone for, pretty easy one in my mind, the Ryzen 5 9600 non-X. Now, this is a new addition to the Ryzen lineup and it's gonna save you roughly 20 to $30 over the 9600X derivative. For this, you lose a few hundred megahertz on the boost clock speed, but you still keep the same number of cores and threads. And crucially, the same support for some of the fantastic B850 motherboards on the market. Now, B850 boards are still a bit more expensive than I'd like, which kind of feels like the story of PC building in 2025. This is the MSI B850 Tomahawk. And to be honest, I'd be happier if it was about $20 cheaper. The reason I've gone B850 is that PCI generation five support is more widespread and I think they're gonna come down in price. Everything is just expensive right now. Motherboards sadly are no exception. Now this particular board gives you Wi-Fi 7, the latest Bluetooth technology and a really solid rear IO with plenty of connectivity. It's a fairly neutral design with a few neon green accents, slightly weird color choice from MSI, but it does the job nicely and is going to allow you to opt for any Ryzen 7 or 9000 CPU with out of the box support and no need for a BIOS update. As far as the CPU cooling, let's talk about the cooler. I have gone ahead and picked up this, the Cooler Master Hyper 212 Pro. Alternatively, you could go for the Vectru V5, Cooler Master do a Halo version of this, just something to knock a bit of temperature off the Ryzen 5 9600 at a cheap price that's gonna be a lot quieter than the included stock cooler. In terms of RAM and SSD, I've gone for a team group combo in this build. Not sponsored, I just quite like these bits. The MP44L is gonna provide two terabytes of NVMe storage in today's build, while the T-Force Delta Kit at 6400 megahertz is gonna provide 32 gigs of fairly fast DDR5 RAM. Looking at some of the memory usage in the gaming benchmarks actually shocked me. Even in a build like this, which is a lot more modest than some of the systems I assemble here on the channel, and we're still seeing like over 20 gigabytes of DRAM usage in Hogwarts Legacy, for example. There's lots of talk right now about VRAM, but DRAM in games is getting bigger and bigger. The penultimate component to talk about is this, the case. This is the Montec XR, and I'm gonna be honest, you could probably swap this case out for five or six other options and not notice a difference. I like this one because it's got that nice fish tank aesthetic we're used to with a couple of included reverse blade fans for intake and a standard blade for rear exhaust. GPU, motherboard, CPU cooler clearance is all pretty good. And for the price, it's just fine. And it looks really quite nice. As I say, there are loads of alternatives you can pick. The Fantex XTV, for example, gives you a little RGB strip down the side, but they're broadly all very similar. And it's not really gonna make that much difference. The final part to talk about is the power supply. I've gone for Corsair's latest refresh of their RM650E. I really like the 750E, and it's good to see they've brought the same design ideas down to their entry-level wattage for this tier. You get a high-efficiency cybernetic certification for noise and power efficiency, and you get little cable combs included to make those cables look that little bit neater. So with that, I think it's time to build a gaming PC. And as always, I'm gonna start with the motherboard, with the RAM, the SSD, and of course, the CPU. It doesn't escape me how turbulent the pricing is right now in the PC building space. It's crazy to think that $429, if the MSRP is to be believed, for the 5060 Ti is suddenly a good price. I remember when we were getting 7800 XTs for $449, and that was like best part of two years ago. GPU demand right now is obviously through the roof, and some of the stuff that's going on just is not helping. So the CPU is, of course, in. I'm next gonna do the memory. I'm gonna use the second and fourth RAM DIMM slots in today's build. I like this T-Force Delta Kit because I think it's quite angular and gives a bit of a gamer aesthetic without being too full on. And obviously there's room to upgrade this right up to 64 gigs if you wanted by just adding an identical kit in a bit later. I'm next gonna do the M.2 SSD. Now on this board, you get this rather nice tallest NVMe slot, which you pull off really easily before sliding the drive into place, securing it under this cool tallest pin and then adding the NVMe heatsink back on. There is one more component though to deal with on the motherboard assembly, and that is this, the Cooler Master Hyper 212 Pro. I always tend to install air coolers onto the motherboard before installing the motherboard into the case. So a standard 120 mil ARGB fan, and then presumably we have the actual tower of the heatsink here, which if you didn't realize is virtually like identical to the original 212 from like a decade ago. Very, very similar tooling, just a fancy paint job and some updated branding. Remember to peel off the little protective cover on the bottom, 
and then I'm going to add into place these AMD brackets. They need to point outwards to make the CPU cooler mounting area a little bit bigger. You'll then need to remove the pre-installed black plastic CPU brackets off the top and bottom of the processor. Add on a dab of the included thermal paste. Definitely don't be using anywhere near the whole tube. A large sort of grain of rice size is going to be about right. And then drop the cooler into place. Each of the four screw threads should line up with the holes on the motherboard. Get these nice and tight with the screwdriver, but leave the fan off as it's easier to put in a bit later. With that all sorted, the next stage is to remove all of the side panels from the case. So there's the rear non-tempered glass panel, and then of course the front tempered glass panel. Put them somewhere safe so you don't smash or break them. And then take a quick glance at the motherboard. This board has got three screws on the top, three along the middle, and three down the bottom. They match up perfectly with the standoffs already in the case. What you then want to do is very carefully slide the motherboard into place, get the IO lined up, get it lined up on all the standoffs. Use the included motherboard screws that come in this little bag, three at the top, three along the middle, and three down the bottom to secure the board into place and make sure it's not gonna go anywhere. I'm then gonna finish the motherboard installation by just adding into place the cooler fan, getting the fan lined up, pop in the bracket on, and it's just a friction fit, so it's nothing to screw in or secure. It just clicks over the top and shouldn't go anywhere. Now, the next phase of the system is going to be the graphics card. For this project, Nvidia kindly seeded us this 5060 Ti as part of our launch media coverage. It goes without saying, of course, they haven't had any pre-review of this video or seen any of our thoughts or feedback. Now, this particular card is from Palette. Interestingly, it's a triple fan, which for some people might seem a little overkill for what is a relatively modest card on the power and heat front. And rather interestingly, it only has a single eight pin GPU power cable. So no PCI Gen 5 power on here. We're seeing that more and more. I think it was on some of the last gen 4060 Ti's. Palette have gone for the eight pin here instead. I'm going to be removing the lanes on the second and third motherboard slots. That's going to allow for this pretty modest two slot card to fit in. And this fairly small card should look pretty well proportioned with the rest of the build today. So slide that in. That feels pretty good to me. And then secure it down with the two screws that we just took out from a moment ago. And with the GPU installed, the final thing to do is the power supply, cables, and wiring. As mentioned earlier, this is Corsair's RM650E, the new 2025 version. And I have to say, really quite like it. Now what you want to do is go ahead and locate all of the input points on the back of the power supply. And I'm gonna add cables in for the CPU, GPU, motherboard, and a SATA power cable for any old school hard drives, SSDs, or RGB and fan hubs too. And then just slide the power supply into place a little something like so. Make sure, of course, to tighten up the four screws on the rear before then plugging in the CPU and motherboard power first. I'm also gonna go ahead and do the front panel cables at this stage, which includes the JFP1 to the bottom right, the HD audio to the bottom left, as well as the USB 3 type A and type C port, both are keyed so it'll only go in one way, as well as completing all the fan and ARGB headers, get these ready to spin and the whole thing ready to power up. Don't forget, of course, as well, to wire up the graphics card with the 8-pin power cable just here. And then the big question is whether this system will turn on for the first time. There we go. I got slightly scared then that it wasn't gonna work. However, it's powered up. Everything seems to be working. The RGB and fans are spinning. And the next stage is installing Windows to get a bit finer control over the RGB and seeing really how good this system looks once it's all properly tweaked and configured. <laughs> Moving through to take a look at the performance of this exact build with the 5060 Ti, but instead this time the 9600 non-X CPU, rather than the 9800X 3D processor used in our normalized gaming benchmarks, and you can see the numbers are pretty strong across the board. These are naturally going to be slightly lower than with that higher end X 3D processor, but you can see in the likes of Alan Wake 2, Apex Legends, Black Ops 6, and Cyberpunk, that frame rates are still pretty strong. A couple of highlights to point out, COD's Black Ops 6 at 1440p high, runs at just over 90 frames per second than average. Hogwarts at 1440p high loves the 16 gigs of VRAM on the 5060 Ti with just over 90. And Marvel's Rivals surpasses 80 FPS at 1440p too. This is a build that at the MSRP prices, if they materialize, provides great performance and actually pretty good value. I just wish Nvidia's 50 series gave us more by way of a generational performance uplift. If you enjoyed today's video, make sure to get subscribed. Thanks for watching. And as always, we'll see you in the next one.